my name's Neil Ferris. I'm the Corporate Director for Economy and Place for the City of York Council. Uh, and welcome here to St John's University and thank you to the University for hosting this evening's event. So tonight is a masterclass in uh, place branding. Uh, the City of York Council, uh, and I'm the lead officer for the City of York Council, is uh, facilitating this exercise on behalf of the people of York. And I say that because we're not leading, we're not dictating, we're facilitating this on behalf of the people of York. Uh, it's a great time uh, for the City of York. Uh, on an international level, uh, we have a high level of presence. We've got uh, Sunday Times, best place in the UK to live last year. We've got the second highest occupancy of any high street in the UK. Uh, our city is taking an increasing role in sub-regional infrastructure decisions. So the government has established transport for the north. Uh, York has 10 million passengers a year going through its station. So we've got a key role in the transport for the north in shaping where, what, what the city's role is, what the role of the north of England is in respect of uh, the future and our own economy. At a more local level, uh, we're currently out consulting on our local plan. That local plan will set the spatial framework for the city for the next 15 years, where our communities of the future will be, where our economic activity will be. We've also got on top of that spatial and strategic plan that we're bringing together, uh, we have specific projects. So we're currently upgrading the roundabouts on the A1237. We've got the Castle Gateway proposal, £20 million there of investment associated one of the most iconic historic buildings in the north of England. It's been at the heart of the history of the UK for, for, for centuries and a great opportunity there. Over £30 million worth of investment on the Castle Gateway. Uh, on the other side of the city, we've got York Central, a huge opportunity for the city in terms of economic growth, 100,000 square metres of economic activity planned for there, 2,500 homes, and a, a, all, all being well, subject to ministerial decisions, £155 million of public money going in to make that project happen. A move then towards the city centre, we've got the Guildhall project, been at the heart of the city's governance for hundreds of years. The council is investing £20 million into that facility, a combination of the ongoing civic um, roles and the uh, sort of governance of, of the city, but also we're co-locating with a retail uh, restaurant offer and uh, economic offer in terms of business space. So, We've got all these activities, we've got all these plans. York is really well positioned to seize the future, seize the opportunities that the economy, the global economy provides for us. So on that basis, how do we knit all those activities, those strategies together? Because what's really important for York is it has to mean something. A city is about is a social function. It's a gathering of people. A city centre is a, it has a purpose, a social purpose. And it's important that all these infrastructure developments mean something both to the people of York, to the visitors of York, and to the potential investors of York. Hence the City Council's um, desire to facilitate a discussion with all those stakeholders to say, well, what does all this mean for you? The first stage of that process uh, starts tonight in respect of a, a masterclass of what does city branding mean? So that we're all on the same footing as to, well, what, what, what does city branding do for us? How does it bring the, that physical investment together? So before I hand on to our speaker tonight, I just want to hand to Sean Bullock, who's the Chief Executive of Make It York, who will do the introduction of our, introduction of our speaker, but will also just give it, touch a little bit on Make It York and its role and how it's excited about the prospect of a city narrative, a city branding proposal. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you uh, all for coming. I'm excited. That's absolutely, I think, the right word. Um, I'm absolutely a newbie. Uh, in York, um, six months now, uh, but it does feel like a fantastic time to have come to the city. Um, as Neil mentioned, a um, huge number of um, capital projects going on, York Central not least. Um, there's the UNESCO designation, which I think puts us 
firmly on a, on a world stage. And of course, there's, there's this project about how we present ourselves, what the, what the York proposition is. Um, and, and I think it is massively exciting. Um, uh, this, this evening is about Martin presenting. Uh, so Martin uh, Boyson is um, is a respected academic uh, and, and an experienced um, and very well respected uh, place branding expert. Indeed, uh, he is the co-founder of the International Place Branding Association and has worked on a whole range of cities including Amsterdam, Oslo, The Hague, Ghent, Luxembourg and Copenhagen. Um, so uh, he and the team know what they're talking about. Um, we're going to begin with a uh, with a masterclass from um, Martin talking, as Neil mentioned, not really about um, place branding as it relates to York, but talking about what it is and what it isn't. And I'm sure he will be, well, I shouldn't paraphrase, but I'm sure he, he will be quick to point out that this isn't about a logo. Uh, this is about fundamentally understanding the identity of the city and the proposition. So he, he'll take us through that. There will then be a, a Q&A. Um, with creative tourists, Alex is here, and I think Wayne is here from Hemingway Design. Uh, Jack is here from Hemingway Design, uh, and that can be absolutely as much about York as we want. Um, so I, I think that that's that's the sort of you know the time to get down to the sort of questions um, of how this project relates in practice to to the city and what it can do for the city. Um, so, so that's broadly. Uh, I think where we're at. Uh, I should say a quick word, which I probably should have said at the beginning, about Make It York. Make It York is basically about uh, economy and place. It's about uh, growing economic prosperity uh, of York for its people and about making sure that the place is attract as attractive as it can be to its residents, to its um, to, to its investors, to its businesses, to it, to those who work here, etc. So this project absolutely sits squarely within our uh, sort of remit and area of interest and it's something we'll be very much uh, enjoying taking part uh, taking part in. So at that point I'll hand you over to Martin and uh, he will take us through the, the masterclass. Enjoy. Thank you. I, I'm already good up. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Um, I, find, I find it very fitting that uh, this is taking place at a university um, because, as pointed out, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what place branding is and what it isn't. I hope to make it not too theoretical, um, and uh, for that I need your help. So I'm going to ask you a couple of times to engage, um, and I hope you will be just as willing as all other audiences up till this point to not think too deeply and just yell out the stuff that I ask you to yell out about. Right. Um, so that's it. Um, quick thing, um, I'm just one of the three companies that are working in this consortium for advising York on their new uh, uh, place branding narrative. Uh, the other one's leader is Hemingway Design. Creative tourists have done a lot of the work uh, up until this point. Uh, so a lot of you might have uh, spoken to Alex or Andrew uh, around uh, the city. And I'm the third one, the for the love of place um, thing. And, and basically the reason that I named the company for the love of place is that I feel um, that that has been missing in a lot of places. Um, there's been a lot of global capital moving around, a lot of tourism, a lot of things that cater to some kind of uniformity or homogeneity or monoculturalism, uh, where the capital, the money that flows around the planet has become more and more detached from the places in which that capital has effect. Uh, think about real estate development, hotel development, tourism, all these different things. And when we cater to a global audience or a global economy or a global market, it becomes a little bit, I think, funny or tragic comedy uh, to a certain sense that in the struggle to become more and more unique, cities become more and more the same. Um, and I think the key to that, uh, to avoiding that, is to do stuff for the love of place. Uh, not so much for the love of the residents as such, but for the love of place. And the residents that are in that place at this very moment are the most important ones, um, but also the residents that used to be here and the residents that are going to be here in the future. And the same thing goes, of course, for companies and also for visitors. Um, so, so that's the, the basic phrase. And I'm going to start off with a small story about a city, a tale of a city. Um, it's a city that was founded by the Romans at the confluence of two rivers and within uh, the Roman road system. It was visited by the Vikings, uh, my ancestors. Sorry for that. Um, it used to be a capital city. It's a university town. It has a national railroad museum. 
a large redevelopment area around the station, one of the largest and most important ones in shaping the city's future in the coming 50 years. It's known for media and creativity scene, which it's investing heavily in. Life sciences as well. It has a very, very high quality of life, consecutively among the highest in its country. And it doesn't have an airport, so if you want to go there, you have to land somewhere else. So the big question is, which city am I talking about? Utrecht. Utrecht, yes. <laughs> the city where I live. Um, and of course, I forgot to mention that Utrecht also have a man magnificent, very, very large Gothic cathedral. Um, it's not called the Minister, uh, the Minster, and it's not as big as yours, partly because half of it uh, got hit by a hurricane and burned down. Uh, so there's a lot of parallels here. Um, so Utrecht is the city where I live, um, and the key to this exercise is that all of these things might seem very, very typical and very, very punctual, very, very identifiable. Those are assets. Those are parts of the storytelling of a certain place. Um, but if you don't watch out, um, mentioning facts, be they historical or economical or whatever, facts, 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 facts. People don't really care about facts. Um, and it, it captures something, um, but there are a lot of similar cities that have more or less the similar beginnings. And they still might be different. They might feel different. Um, and that thing about feeling different and being different is basically saying to us that it's not about those things. It's about something behind those things. It's about something deeper. It's about something more fundamental. It's about values. It's about purpose. It's about why. It's not about mentioning a lot of assets. It's not about just referring to history. It's about making all of that relevant for today uh, and for the future. Uh, so that also means that it's not a deductive exercise. Right? It's not just throwing in something and then making some kind of DNA analysis and then rolls out your strategy. It's not like that. There has to be leadership, there has to be choices, there have to be a lot of resonance amongst the people that actually make the city so that the things that is eventually communicated to external audiences isn't a lie, isn't just a pretty painted picture, but it's something that people will actually go behind. And of course, York. The story could also be about York. I remember, I was just told that it's not a national railroad museum anymore and stuff, but anyways, uh, that seems uh, uh, funny. You actually have the city walls, so we had to recreate them uh, in, in the street lines and stuff like that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is the more theoretical part. Some conceptual distinctions and why they matter. And this is because even amongst professionals, words and concepts are being used synonymously. Uh, around here. Words like promotion, branding, marketing, all these words. They're being used as if they mean the same thing. And if you don't watch out, if you don't make the distinctions between these different concepts, uh, you will end up doing the wrong things for the wrong purposes. You will create organizations that have the wrong KPIs and you will actually basically create a situation that is not feasible. And a lot of cities before you have gone down this path of creating confusion. Um, and it's something that I'll try to make clear to you guys today. And I know that when you leave this room, you will very quickly fall back to using these words interchangeably. But then I hope that when we have 100 people that they will also be capable of keeping each other sharp. So there only needs to be one person in the room that says something like, well, you remember what this strange Danish guy was talking about. Uh, maybe that is something that we should put down on the table now and think about. So the first thing is, place marketing is often seen as synonymous to place promotion, but it's much, much more than that much more than that. If you open up a first year student textbook on marketing, it will tell you something about a marketing mix. Uh, it's seven P's or nine C's, depending on what, as long as it starts with the same letter. Um, but only one of those are promotion or marketing communication. But for some reason, when we add place to the mix, um, then suddenly people think that it's the same thing. And what then happens is that People, stakeholders, even stakeholders, for example, businesses that are very, very well aware, aware of these differences in their own business, when it's about the place, they will also start to expect that it's basically about place promotion. So then you will end up with offline print, radio and television campaigns, online presence, possibly social media campaigns, uh, and live events, and that's it. That's it. And then you're done. Right. Now, the next thing that happens is when we start talking about place branding, People start to think, well, a brand, that's a logo, right? I mean, that's literally the branding. That's also a little bit of a Viking word, right? That we burn stuff into our slaves so that we know from who's the owner. Um, and then the cattle and stuff, and then it became marketed from, uh, from the US. Uh, but 
still, if you Google place branding, uh, and if you talk about place branding, a lot of times people expect you to end up with a logo. Right? And I'm not saying you shouldn't have a logo, I'm just saying it's not really that important. Uh, if you make one that's mostly effective for internal purposes so that people can see where did the money or the, uh, or the investment that we spend on this go on. But it's not, there's never been a logo that really, really convinced people somewhere else uh, to go and travel somewhere, for example, or to go and invest somewhere. The popular logos for cities that you might know have become famous because the cities that they are from are, say, are famous, not because the logos were well crafted. So that's an important thing to, to keep on. And it's very, very basic. I hope I'm not insulting your intelligence, but this goes wrong all the time, even amongst professionals. And there's, of course, a certain trend. Uh, I remember when I Amsterdam launched uh, back in the day, um, I had a, a friend that worked at a creative company uh, in Amsterdam, um, and they created a map of European cities where they looked for words in the names of the places and came up with be Berlin, Copenhagen, Madrid, about you. Um, or, you know, Warsaw, A, Roma. So you were allowed to add one word and then it should meet some kind of sense. And the weird thing is that was meant as a joke. And in the years afterwards, a lot of these have popped up and become reality. And that's not because that guy, at least, I really don't think so. I'm starting to get, I don't think he actually sold those ideas to all of these cities, but it sort of like came up uh, consecutively. Copenhagen, there were like four of the five uh, uh, really brilliant consultancies that came up with the same idea. And then people think, well, if four of the five come up with the same idea, then that must be really, really good. Whereas, you know, uh, probably it isn't. I'm from Copenhagen, and I can tell you, well, the color is even wrong. And the only association I have with this is the top of a Carlsberg button that needs to be opened and drunk as fast as possible. So please don't print this everywhere in my city. Copenhagen is blue, so even get that thing right. But it's, it's much more about those logos. And actually, this is sort of like even the wrong sign, because it's not about logos. So what is it about? Well, with place promotion, you basically aim for influencing the demand. Nothing shocking there. You do that, and this is where it gets complicated, by taking some of the supply of the city, it can be its museums, its attractions, its hotel, and whatever, and try to create the demand for what's already there. Sometimes we create promotional agencies for tourism or inward investment, or, well, they might uh, compete against each other, uh, create different stories about the city, whatever fits their own market purpose, and then they won't uh, really realize why they will end up with having no effect at all because all of these things tells different stories to different people at different times and it's not really having any sort of consistency. But what's more important is that a lot of organizations for place promotion, they're sort of like, they have no influence on the supply. They're not at the table when we talk about should we build new hotels. They're not at the table when we talk about, should we invest in a new museum? Should we do this? Should we do that? So basically, we do a lot of stuff that creates supply in a city, and then we expect the promotional agency to go out and create demand for that thing that we created. And that's unfair. And this is one of the chief mistakes, because you can imagine if you start creating an assignment for uh, Make It York, for example, or something like that, and you start writing down what the purpose is of such an organization, and you formulate the KPIs, a lot of times you will actually have the expectations that they will do all those promotional stuff, the live events and the websites and all these different things, and that that is going to increase uh, demand for whatever you built, for whatever you do. And then they're to blame if the hotel beds aren't being sold, whereas they might be in a position of knowing the markets and advising on which kind of hotels you should build, if you should build any at all. So that's the other side. I'm an urban geographer and planner by training. Um, and of course, planning is a lot about place development, and place redevelopment, the, the actual supply of the city. Right? The quality of life, the quality of building, the quality of infrastructure, our public spaces, stuff like that. That's what we're creating over here. And a lot of times then the demand here is then something that we want to tag into. So we, we sort of like assume that there's a demand for whatever we're doing. And of course, place marketing first really happens when you influence both supply and demand. Because what we're influencing with place marketing is not just supply or demand, it's the actual spatial choice. You want to make supply and demand meet. Again, first year textbook marketing. If you want to make supply and demand mean, meet, then you need to have influence on both. And I'm not saying the marketeers should decide what we're building. Right? I'm just saying possibly they should be included at an earlier stage. So that's basically what place marketing is about, fi fixing this. And a lot of times as an advisor, when I come into cities and they already have an organization up and going, again, we will see metrics like 
um, number of overnight stays when it's about tourism, right? So you have sort of like the, the holy four grail of tourism uh, marketing agencies. And that's always to have more people coming that spend more money and they stay longer and they come back more often, right? And then nowadays they talk about it on social media, media and Instagram themselves or whatever, right? That's sort of like what every city has as a metric. Even cities that are suffering from over-tourism still have those metrics, right? So then they will blame the promotional agency for attracting too many tourists, but the promotional agency will have the task to attract more tourists. This is even true for Amsterdam, or at least it was until the last local uh, elections. So if you don't map out carefully what the responsibilities are of the different stakeholders in the city and what they are actually having influence on, you end up in a typical situation where the place promotional agency is expected to do a lot of promotional stuff, but they are actually supposed to be justified by the choices that people make and they have no influence whatsoever on what's happening over on this side, which eventually always leads to somebody at some point pulling the plug. It's just a matter of time. So these are a couple of conceptual distinctions and why they matter. And the rest of the masterclass is going to be about the missing piece. Because you can do all of these without doing place branding. Every place is branding itself whether you choose to take influence over this process or not. I'm going to show you this in a while and how this works. So not influencing demand, not influencing supply, not influencing choice, but influencing image is what place branding is about. Right? So the task of place branding is basically image orchestration. We want to change what people think, what they feel, what they associate with the plan, with the place. And of course, if you want to do this effectively, you need, from a place branding perspective, to direct which kind of choices do we actually want people to make that reinforces our image the way we want it to be. Which kind of demand do we need to dip into? Which kind of markets do we need to develop? And which kind of supply do we actually need to develop? And how do we do that in a way that it sort of like helps steering our image orchestration in the right direction? <coughs> These are the fundamental questions. So it has a really, really large component of selectivity. Right? If you are really, really ambitious about image orchestration, you do not let the market dictate what you as a city should develop and when and why. You need to have a plan about what you actually want. And when there are opportunities in the market that fits that what you want, then you have to dig into those opportunities with all the power and all the concentration and all the focus you can muster. I'm going to show you an example of a city later that has been doing that for quite a long time. But we're not there yet. Place marketing is not the same as place branding because this happens as well. Right? So we already have place marketing is not the same as place promotion. Place branding is not the same as the logos and stuff like that. But place marketing and place branding is also consequently being confused and used as synonymous. So place marketing is basically about balancing supply and demand in, for example, foreign direct investment, destination management, business development, tourism promotion, talent attractions, events, but also housing, right? public squares, the high street was mentioned. All of these things is basically about balancing supply and demand. The place branding part is about making sure that everything we do on this side from a point, uh, from also from the perspective of reputation management, creates on-brand behavior and on-brand communication. And that means that we have to defi define together what on-brand then means for York. Right. Or put in the for the love of place terminology that I mentioned earlier, how does York remain York? And what does that mean in a globalizing economy, for example? What does that mean? How does York remain York? If you do life sciences, like almost every city do, why is that different in York? What makes it different? How does it fit? What's the story that fits that? And of course, the logic is that if you do on-brand behavior, so if you make decisions in local planning, for example, in distribution of funds, in coalition funding structures, prioritizations, that is on-brand, then of course, it's much, much easier to make sure that there's on-brand communication. Because what happens in the city communicates much, much more than any advertorial campaign can ever hope to do. So bringing these two together basically means that we need to have a piece here in the middle that helps us direct that when we develop our business climate, when we develop the quality of life of our residents or the experience economy, that all of the things that we do here is unified from one kind of core narrative, that is York. 
so that when we have, also from a promotional standpoint, when we try to dig into potential businesses and investors or try to attract talent and potential students, that the story that we tell about York here and here is the same. At least have the same connotation. The proposition is different, right? So if I want to attract you as a student, then of course the proposition is different than if I want to attract you as an investor for a company. But there should be some kind of of essence in there that is York in both of them so that all that communication together both in behavior and in promotional efforts for example reinforce each other and if you don't do that and there's a lot of examples of course of cities that haven't done that the danger is especially for a city like York and to a certain extent this has already happened is that this part of the pie is going to dominate the other parts of the pie because here is a lot of reach and although we are telling certain stories for a very long time to attract potential tourists and tourist operators and so on, um, we tended to treat, treat this as an isolated thing. But of course, if somebody hears something about York as a potential tourist, what do you think that does when they are supposed to be attracted as a potential talent or a potential student or a potential investor? That all creates the same kind of storyline uh, for York. And for companies, I mean, companies are not just companies that take very, very rational decisions. We know this a lot from economic geography, that companies are very good at explaining why their decisions were rational, for example, relocation choice, afterwards. They're very, very good at, at sort of like re-engineering uh, uh, their decision points, but in a lot of situations, they weren't really that rational about it. Um, we know the same thing for residents, a lot. I mean, uh, I'm not gonna do this right now, but I could ask you, when did you move for the last time? Why did you do that? I'm sure you have a very convincing story that you've told yourself for a very, very long time. But I also know that if I had interviewed you at the moment that you were searching for a home, that that two things would not really fit. And we know that a lot. So all of these things can be sort of like put together in the notion that a lot of times we hear that the sum is more than the parts. And if that's supposed to be true and not just taken as an assumption, we need to make sure that all these different parts contribute to the same sum and not to the sum that is handy in that market or the sum that is handy in that market because then it won't be more than the sum of the parts. <coughs> now, there's a brilliant scholar not too far away from here currently at Leicester uh, University, Mihalis Kavaratsis, uh, who wrote an article in 2004 called From City Marketing to City Branding. And he has this quote which says it all starts with the realization that all encounters with the city takes place through perception. And he created this model very much focused from communication science, uh, which says, well, you have primary, secondary, and tertiary communication. And the reason I'm showing you this model is because he emphasizes that primary communication is actually what the city does. And the secondary communication, advertisement, PR, logo, slogans, whatever, campaigns, is actually just a small part of it. Right? How people walk down the street, the speed they walk, whether they're smiling or not. Right? There's a lot of things intangible that becomes tangible when you start thinking about it. The behavior, the organizational structure, how people greet you when you come for a business meeting, um, the infrastructure, the public spaces, even the public space furniture can tell you a story. Does it have, uh, uh, what do you call like uh, this, like a back leaning? What do you call this? This part of the chair? Back. Back. Ah, the back of the chair, sorry. <laughs> Thinking too complicated there. Uh, so does the benches have a back? Or have they been removed to make sure that homeless people can't sleep on them? You know, this kind of stuff. It communicates. Uh, it might not be in your face, but all of these things together communicate and tell a story. Um, and that's, I think, one of the chief lessons. So his, his quote here can basically be sort of like, uh, rephrased by everything in a city communicates and if everything in a city communicates my statement is that places don't need brands they are brands they are brands because they work the way brands work in your brain so we're not talking about a blank piece of paper where we're going to design the brand of York because the brand of York is already there what we're going to try to do is to help York define which direction it wants to take its brand uh, define what the brand currently is and how that differs between different target audiences uh, and to figure out what would be a direction of trying to steer that and what are then the actions that follows that. Not the communication campaign as such, but what decisions do you then have to take? Right. York Central, for example. Such a redevelopment area is not just a chance for economic prosperity of social justice or whatever. 
Um, that, those are very, very important things. But it's also a massive communication vehicle that tells you something about what York is going to be about. Why York takes, takes the decisions that it takes. And if that is not incorporated into something as large as that, the impact on the image of the city will be one big lost opportunity. Even if it's an economic success, it might feel detached from the rest of the city per design. And that's something that is worth thinking about because it might even be so that you would go opt for a less economic profitable proposition for York Central if it fits with the story of the city uh, better. So I'm going to need your help now. Places don't need brands, they are brands. Um, so I'm going to need your help. I want you to scream out at the top of your lungs which place I'm showing you a photo of now. Okay? I'm going to show a couple of photos and you just keep screaming out. You ready? Don't hold back. Don't try to be smart. Don't try to explain. Don't look at your neighbor. It's fine. Okay, here it comes. Three, two, one. Where are we? Paris. Where are we? Paris. Where are we? Paris. <laughs> so, of course, I'm playing with you. Um, but that, that's the purpose. I'm going to do this a couple of times in different ways. Uh, we are in China. Um, and uh, you might see that the banlieue is, uh, suddenly became very, very, you know, close by the Eiffel Tower. You might also see that it's actually missing a couple of stories to be real Paris. Uh, they've reconstructed Champs Elysees, and they had this glorious program. Uh, there, are, I think, there are three replicas of the Eiffel Tower currently in China. Um, but the most interesting one is the nine towns projects around Shanghai, where they needed to give some kind of identity to the place that would be a little bit different from this stuff that they're building everywhere. Uh, to accommodate 400 million people moving into the cities at an astonishing rate. Um, so uh, they decided to take a couple of architectural feats. So they built one that was supposed to look like Paris. Um, they built one, uh, I think, Thames Town, it's called, which is supposed to look like uh, England. Uh, they built the Dutch village, which is supposed to look like uh, the Netherlands and so on. And they, they had all different themes for these nine towns. And it's basically just the core of this small town, as they say, with about a million residents each. Uh, which is just a town there, um, uh, to, to make it a little bit different, to sort of like distinguify them from each other. Um, and the rest is just, you know, the outskirts is just some of the same. These places are really not that popular with Chinese for actually living or doing businesses. The high streets there are dramatic in, in these uh, redistructed areas. Um, but what they are being used for is wedding photographs. Uh, so they're very <laughs> wee chattery, or, which is the Instagrammable version of uh, in China. Uh, but it tells you something else. Um, I would argue that you could look at it this way. Is the Eiffel Tower the thing that made Paris famous? What do you think? <coughs> or is it the other way around? It's a bit, I would argue it's the other way around. That is a bit like the same thing as with the logos, right? That I Amsterdam thing was famous because I'm, Amsterdam became famous. It's, it's the other way around. I'm pretty sure that if you put down the Eiffel Tower somewhere else than in Paris, the original one, um, that it would have been famous for maybe 10 or 20 years because of its engineerial, uh, ingenuity. Um, but then probably it would have been dismantled and gone away. Probably. Um, it sure wouldn't have made some kind of uh, you know, mediocre city somewhere in France or anywhere else famous for a very long point of time. So the Eiffel Tower became famous because it became a symbol for a city that is already famous. And if you think about Paris as a brand, I'll offer you this. I'm not going to ask you what your associations are with Paris because that's basically a waste of time. We know what the associations are with Paris. And we know that a lot of the associations with Paris, if you ask a lot of people in our part of the world, or the western part of the world, but also outside, is focused around love, passion, everything that you can relate to passion, basically. Light is related to passion. The food is related to passion. The the, 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 the fashion is related to passion, all these different things. Whether they like it or not, right? This makes Paris an incredibly strong brand. Doesn't say anything about whether that's positive or negative, that's the context. But it makes it a very, very strong brand because not only have people heard about Paris everywhere, they also have more or less the same idea about what Paris stands for, right? Even though the financial cluster around La Défense really don't like the fact that the top of mind associations with Paris are all about you know, love and joy and stuff like that. Probably arrogant waiters. 
Um, but there's definitely nothing in there about financial transactions or you know, uh, being one of the more important financial cities in the world. If I'd done this with London, that would be the flip side of this. Right. So there are, there are a couple of things to, to realize here. I mean, Paris didn't decide over 100 years to build this reputation. It grew. There was some people that had very good invested interest to, in, in getting this uh, uh, further on. But I mean, philosophers, poets, in the literature, uh, in the movies, uh, Paris was the thing. And that image, that stereotypical idea of Paris is a brand. And it's been reinforced again and again and again and again over a very, very long time. It's a narrative that is reinforced in our behavior as well. And it's, it's really that strong uh, that we become irrational again. We are very irrational beings. I'm saying that in the middle of a university, I realize. But we are incredibly irrational beings. So imagine, it used to be very popular to go for a romantic getaway to Paris. Right? In some age groups, it still is. But, you know, it used to be the thing. A romantic weekend in Paris. Well, I'm asking you, honestly, to reflect within your own mind. You don't have to yell out now. <laughs> um, let's say you and your partner goes to Paris with the purpose of having a romantic weekend. And it's not romantic. Is that the fault of Paris? <laughs> Is it the fault of your partner? <laughs> and if you're honest, it's probably also your fault, right? It might even be, back in the days, the ultimate relationship test. Because if in all places you cannot manage to have a romantic weekend in Paris, then just, you know, forget about it. And the thing here is the associations and the brand is so strong, it's been so layered by so many people over such a long time, that even when it fails to deliver, you blame yourself, you don't blame Paris. I think that's interesting. And you can even imagine how it works out in practice, right? If you have a date, night, well, in Paris, then that adds a little bit to it. Paris adds a little bit to it, to a date night. But it also adds to stuff that it shouldn't add to. For example, a, you know, business dinner, one-on-one, -on -one. business dinner. If your partner knows that that's in Paris, it suddenly gets another layer, whether you like it or not. Right? And you can have a perfectly romantic, not intentional romantic business dinner in London, but that wouldn't have that thing back at home. But in Paris, it does, whether we like it or not. We know it's ridiculous, but we are ridiculous in the way we work. And we have to realize that to a certain extent. So places don't need brands, they are brands. Um, and this is where we're going to make another kind of experiment. So we work in mysterious ways um, through what cultural geographers called meta-geography in the sense that places cannot really escape their geographical hierarchy in these processes. This means when I talk to my friends and my network in Denmark and I said, well, I might be you know, onto a project in York, all my Danish friends were like, oh, Jorvik, uh, don't burn down the place and rape and pillage, right? Because that's what we do. Um, apparently, you know, raping, burning, pillaging and something is really, really cool if it's a very long time ago that it happened. Um, anyways. Um, and when I talk to, to people in the Netherlands about this, they said, like, York? And I was like, yeah, York. New York? No, no, not, not New York. No, York. And they're like, oh, oh, so, oh, what's that? Uh, that's very, very far up north, isn't it? I almost got this thing that they thought it was almost Scotland. Um, and then I was like, well, what, what do you think about York? And they're like, yeah, you know, rainy, windy, you know, boring, grey. Sorry. They're well-educated people. A lot of them are geographers. You'd, you know, um, you'd suppose that they'd be better human beings, uh, but they're not. No. So what you get is the Britain bonus. Basically, we're like, oh yeah, you know, the UK, yeah, they're there to catch all the rain. Um, so, um, so that's what you get for York. Um, but, it, but it's a quite intrinsic process, and, and it might be unfair to a large extent, but it is how it works. The further away you are, the more likely you are to make these kind of stereotypical sort of like contractions uh, in your associations. And the more likely you are to fall victim to this brain of yours not liking the vacuum and then just filling it with something. Right? So Africa, Southern Africa, Botswana, Gaborone, well, you cannot really escape that. It doesn't stop cities from trying. Dubai has had a very deliberate strategy for a very long time to become a world city. 
I'm sure you know about this because they're quite successful in investing a lot of money in, <laughs> in developing uh, their city and in making sure that all the airplanes in the world has to go there, right? creating a, a hub in the global uh, network economy. Um, and what they've been very mindful about is that, especially in the beginning, to make sure that a lot of the things that they did communicated locally, local cultural values like the Palm Islands, but communicated to the global, mainly Western audience before the rise of China, um, to communicate it to a, um, a global audience about world city stuff, about stuff that was more, you know, could have been more or less anywhere. Um, but that anywhere wanted to be somewhere. So Dubai really invested a lot in their place, place development in becoming a world city, really, you know, building the tallest skyscrapers locked in competition with Abu Dhabi or Qatar or a lot of these other places around. And they were very, very mindful about not really communicating that they were one of the United Arab Emirates, because they expected that Arab would feature Middle Eastern associations. So they did not want that. So if you have a city that really tries to pull apart from its actual state construction, and because of our lack of knowledge of how these things actually work, uh, on a farther, further away place, uh, they actually became very successful in not really uh, uh, carrying the United Arab Emirates story uh, uh, towards us. But of course, you're bound to find out somewhere. But if they have gotten into that space before you find out with their world city and their mega projects and all these different things, then you're not as likely to see this as something that will fill in a vacuum because they filled in that vacuum for you. It doesn't need to be that far away or that exotic. Oslo has the same thing. Oslo is a, uh, one of the fastest uh, and youngest growing capitals in, uh, in Europe, actually. Um, but it finds itself to be perceived as on the edge of Europe, very far away. And more than that, if people know about Oslo, and they haven't been there, and they're not from Denmark or Sweden, so they're not laughing, um, <laughs> they might know that Oslo is the capital of Norway, sort of like vice versa, Gabron Botswana syndrome. Um, but Norway has a very, very strong brand based on its nature, based on its fjords and its mountains and Vikings and all these things, uh, but basically in the landscape, right? Outdoor tourism. Right? That's what Norway is really, really, really strong in. Possibly one of the most beautiful countries in the world, especially according to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and they actually had the strategy, and we were advising them, that they said, like, well, of course we know that this is an asset as well. But we are 60% of the economy and half the population of the whole country, and we're suffering from the fact that Norway is trying to project itself as this fantastic, far away, uh, outdoor destination where you can really escape civilization and all these different things, whereas we are trying to position ourselves as an interesting Scandinavian city uh, where there's a lot of real estate development opportunities and there's a high quality of life and equality of community and very low inequality and all these different things. We don't get across with that story when people only know that we are the capital of Norway and they see Norway as this getting away place, then Oslo is suffering from that as well. And there might be associations to, to trick. I mean, Scandinavian associations can be very, very positive for a city. They can also be very positive for Norway. And within the city of Oslo, you of course have stuff from the Vikings. Uh, that features into this and features into that as well, but it might not feature into what Oslo is actually trying to do nowadays. So that means that they need to turn their Viking ship museum into a museum that does not only tell these stories, but also tells a current resonance and relevant story about Oslo today, which basically means showing a different kind of museum, not just putting in a ship somewhere in a room and saying, well, that's it. Um, but it goes further than that. Uh, than that, how these processes work. Just with Paris, movies also comes into the play. I don't know if you have seen the Vikings series on History Channel. Um, there's a conundrum right there because History Channel is not really about history and the Vikings series there is, well, very creatively liberal uh, <laughs> dealing with history, but also with geography. So they have this image, if you know the series, if you don't, I'll describe it for you. They have this image where you see a very typical Norwegian fjord landscape. It's beautiful, right? And then underneath it says, Skærak, Denmark. <laughs> now, Denmark, Visit Denmark actually had to launch a small campaign explaining to people that that wasn't Denmark, that Denmark was also beautiful, but that that was actually Norway. 
So what happens here is that uh, if you are doing this for the UK market, then Denmark, with association with Vikings, is actually pretty strong. So you want that village to be in Denmark, also because the hero of the story, or the antichrist of the story, is basically from Denmark. Right? But you also want to have that wild, beautiful art history landscape. So you just, you know, you just say like, well, this is Denmark. And that was a very successful series. And it went on for a very long time, I think seven or eight seasons or something like that. And every time Skerak, Denmark looked like the UNESCO World Heritage Gaiaranga Fjord. <laughs> Nothing stopping that. So there are places all over the place. We, you need to know that if places are brands, it's not just York that's a brand. Yorkshire is also a brand. Uh, northern part of England is a brand. England itself is a brand. The UK is a brand. All these different things. And I'm not saying that you need to try to influence all of these things, but you need to understand how they dig into your vacuum and not expect that everybody knows York or knows what York is about. Right? If this is a problem or not, is not part of that analysis. That's again the choice. That's what we want. Is it a problem that people have the wrong associations or they don't know you? depends whether you need them or not, whether you want them or not. So it's not automatically that if people have never heard about you, that you should make sure that they've heard about you. That's not automatic the thing, because then you fall into the other trap of thinking that your place is so great, you're in love with it, which I like, right? but you think your place is so great that the problem is that the rest of the world doesn't know that it's so great. If you think that's the only logic, then you will invest all your money in promotion, because then the solution will be to tell the whole world how great you are, hmm? to com accommodate all these global markets, telling them all these stories about how great you are, how good you are, and all these different things, which all other cities like you are also doing, and you will be forgotten in the wildness of communicative messages, just like you are hit every day by, what is it, 40,000 advertisement messages, and your brain have been trained is just ignoring it. Back in the days when cities really started making work of promotional adv uh, advertising, um, it was a forest which was empty and somebody started yelling, so a lot of people heard it. Now it's a forest where everybody's yelling all the time and the one that's shutting up might be, you know, unique. So, places don't need brands, they are brands, and then the thing that follows is, well, let's then manage them as such. If, if they are brands, let's then also manage them as if they are brands. Because, as I tried to, to show with the examples of Paris and Botswana and Gaborone, playing a little bit around with you, um, is that they work that way in our brain, but also that they work that way in the brain whether or not it's a deliberate strategy. Right. So cities brand themselves. The thing is, do we let it to the global markets or to coincidence or to what an investor wants to do with our city? Do we allow that to shape what the city is going to be? Or do we try to take control, knowing that the makeability of this is modest? knowing that we cannot change everything, knowing that we do not want some kind of totalitarian brand-driven regime, uh, but having an idea of what you actually want, what you're about, is going to empower you when you are faced with opportunities or challenges to make the right kind of prioritizations. That's what it's about. And I'm going to show you The Hague, and, and you were asked to have some associations with The Hague, and I'm just gonna, gonna run. What were your associations uh, with The Hague? Uh, war trials. War trials. Legal. Legal. Business. World Federation of Great Towns. The World Federation of Great Towns. That sounds towers. very specific. Towers. That sounds very specific. Yeah. Uh, shell. Shell? Mm -hmm. Peace. Boring Peace. Peace. Boring politicians. Yes. Go with the pearl earrings. The girl with the pearl earring. Yeah. Rembrandt. Sorry? Rembrandt. Rembrandt. They're, they love you now in The Hague. <laughs> Just, that's <laughs> by Amsterdam and Leiden, but yeah. Container ships, all right? Genocide. Genocide. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not in The Hague, but anyways, yeah. There's a very strong projector um, out there. Admin. Sorry? Admin. Administration. Administration, all right, yeah. Anything else? The beach. The beach. The beach, all right. They also love you now. It's good to know. So what The Hague has been doing uh, for a very long time, The Hague is the government seat of the Netherlands. Um, uh, it's not the largest town at all. Uh, it has about 450,000 inhabitants, and there's a larger region which is about a million, but I mean it's in the Netherlands, so everything is so close by that the actual metropolitan region is 7.6 million and includes Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Delft and Leiden and Utrecht, where I live. Um, but they have a very, very strong profile, and this profile is not really a coincidence. And I'm going to show you this because The Hague actually works 
from this place brand management perspective. They're working very, very um, focused on this, uh, which is a feat in its own right. Um, and it doesn't matter that much what theme they have. It matters how they're dealing with that theme, with that profile. Okay? So government seat of the Netherlands, um, they are a UN city. Uh, they have the Peace Palace, um, which is sort of like for international relations. This is kind of like the Eiffel Tower. Um, they have the International Criminal Court of Justice, for example. Um, and they work very, very focused in acquisition, for example, together with the national governments of the Netherlands, to get large, big, boring political events to the city, because that fits the profile of the city. And then, of course, they try to make it not that boring. Um, but you can imagine, I mean, The Hague, 450,000 inhabitants. A lot of global inter, uh, uh, international relation, uh, diplomacy, NGOs, uh, all of these things are in The Hague. Whereas it's just actually a small city. You have the same thing a little bit with Geneva, um, that these cities have managed to, 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 to come into a very select number of cities. Uh, but The Hague has turned it into a strategy, not just something that also happened, but they have turned it into a strategy. Um, and that strategy is very focused on them being the international city of peace and justice. And uh, being an international city of peace and justice, by the way, also commits them to be both, you know, peaceful and justice in their own city, right? It's not like they're running around the planet and saying, like, we're the international city of peace and justice, we're solving the problems of the world, and then not solving the problems down on the street and in the neighborhoods. So it commits them to the same values, to the same ideals that they project internationally, they, it commits them to do that in their own city as well. So it's not just, you know, talking the talk. It's actually walking the walk in their own city. And if they're not, the population is going to use it against them. It's like, well, well, you kind of sort of like, are you only a city for peace and justice for people in, you know, suits and ties? Or are you also that uh, for the, the socially weak and disenfranchised in your neighborhoods? Knowing your own profile and what you want and what you want to resonate and what you want to be relevant for also helps you to cooperate with other cities. For example, this would never have happened if it was Donald Trump, by the way, uh, but back then it was Obama and he's a brand as an own right, in his own right. Um, so you really would like to connect that, you want to use, maximize that. And they knew very, very well that politics and international relations are boring unless they're infotainment, which is mostly not as good uh, a situation. Um, but mainly they're boring. Uh, so what you need to do is to need to create a hook. You need to create some kind of attention for this. This is something that fits the profile of The Hague very, very well, but you want to make sure that it reaches a larger audience because we have something that's on brand, and when we have something that's on brand, we want to maximize exposure of that. If it's off brand, we want to kill it, we want to stop it. If it's neutral, it's fine, but if it's on brand, we really want to maximize exposure. And how, do the, who, how did they then do that? They made sure that Obama went to Amsterdam in front of the Night Watch Rembrandt painting, right? which is in Amsterdam. This gives you a sense. A city having Obama, sort of like the, the ace on their hand, is giving it out to another city because they know that when that happens in, uh, in, in Amsterdam, it will go all around the world and all global media because it is an interesting story. And it's an interesting backdrop that he's giving this press conference there. If he would have given it in The Hague, it would not really have gotten that much attention. It would still be there because it's Obama, but it wouldn't really have gotten onwards and, and gotten uh, traction. And almost everywhere in all that global news coverage, there would be somewhere, almost a footnote or a small paragraph in this story, where it would explain why Obama were in the Netherlands. Right? He was there for the nuclear security summit in The Hague. So they maximize the exposure, and you know most people don't care about that. That's fine. But the people that need to care about it, care about it. And if they're continuously bombarded with things that's on brand for The Hague, then that actually works towards the common purpose. But it goes much further than that. More, maybe you've heard about Benjamin Barber. I don't know, uh, he's a quite famous writer. And he wrote a, a, a book which got almost every city mayor in the world uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, because it was called If Mayors Ruled the World, right? Uh, I think in terms of, of promotion, he couldn't have chosen a better title. And the sales department went crazy because, of course, all mayors in the world wanted to have that book and give it to a lot of people, right? And um, the book itself is actually not that great, I say. Um, but the last chapter is a proposal. Basically, I'm, I'm 
making it very brief. But basically he's saying, you know, the United Nations is not working because that many countries are not really going to solve anything. So instead of that, let's have 40,000 cities unite, let them form a global parliament of mayors because mayors are closer to the population, they're closer to the actual solutions of the large uh, challenges that humanity faces, such as climate change, social inequality, and all these different things. And so that was the idea. And there were two cities in the world that contacted Benjamin Barber and said, well, are you serious about that proposal in your last chapter? And one of them was The Hague. And they set up the Global Parliament of Mayors. I think there are 4,000 cities committed. And it's not really getting off ground. I mean, the big, the big launch event was, was a big success. But it's not really growing out yet. It's not really fruition. It's not really being a big thing yet. But it might. It might in 10 years or in 20 years. And then it's in The Hague. So then it's not just a UN city, then it's also a global parliament of mayor city. This is smart. It didn't cost that much. It was just an event. It was just an organization and a conference. And it got a lot of traction and a lot of business-related investment uh, opportunities for all these mayors coming into The Hague for this event. And then, of course, having all these side traction apartments with Dutch water technology companies and all these different things. So the national government went in and supported it as well. It's very smart. During the financial crisis, there were two cities that proposed uh, to open uh, financial tribunals for international arbitration for financial crimes. Two cities, Paris and The Hague, again. Again, it's not really flowing up. We need another and a deeper and a longer crisis for that. It has been established, but it's not really a big thing. But then you would not only have international criminal court and war crimes, you would also have uh, financial crimes against humanity, uh, which would also fit the profile of the city. And they move on. It's not just about old stuff. The events that they attract, so not the ones they organize everywhere, but the events they attract, they are either focused on, for example, this is One Young World, which is about a lot of people, young people, coming in there, meeting with world leaders and having a discussion about what the big challenges are uh, for, for our planet and, and how to solve them. Um, they attract that. And when that lands in The Hague, this is a traveling event, when this lands in The Hague, they make sure that it's a city-wide feast, basically. Um, and because it actually landed in The Hague, it's also going to go to much larger cities than it usually went to, which is fun for the event. Their own events, The Hague International Open Day, it's basically just an event like a lot of cities would have, but in The Hague, it's about International Open Day. They invite the expat community from all of the Netherlands to come there, and they can get questions asked about healthcare, childcare, whatever, a lot of stuff that they cannot get serviced from in their own local uh, communities, and they can do that in The Hague. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, they have the peace run. They have a lot of different things that digs into this. And when important, famous uh, people from diplomacy, world leaders are in The Hague, they have their own small TEDx. So they're asked, if you're here anyway, would you like to go to this neighborhood cafe and discuss this issue with some of our citizens and some of our students of international law or international diplomacy? So then you get The Hague Talks. Right? I think it was 10 to 12 year, uh, times a year and on its height. It's a little bit less now. Um, where people would go in and they would be, they would be in The Hague for other reasons, uh, but if they had time over, uh, they would go in and they would start to do this. So you would actually feel that around the neighborhood. You can imagine that people living in The Hague suddenly start being, it feels more relevant. It's in their own neighborhoods. It's not just in the international village, so to speak. The business developments. Uh, of course, the, the Hague has business development clusters and industrial uh, uh, areas just like anywhere else. Um, of course, they have digital, innovative uh, 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 companies. Uh, but in The Hague, those companies form The Hague Security Delta, where they're invested in fintech, in govtech, in a lot of these things that might be kind of solutions that could be used for a lot of different things. But in The Hague, these companies actually invest part of their own value proposition, part of their own brand value in the brand value of the city, because it resonates and it serves their purposes. Right, so when you're developing fintech, in The Hague, it's not just about a nice app or something like that. That's in Amsterdam. But it's about the peace and justice part of it. Right? It's about protecting uh, your rights as a digital citizen, for example, and all these different things. How does that work? How does international internet security actually work? A smart city in The Hague is not just being a smart city. It's smart city, but what about privacy? But what about, you know, you, you get the, the feeling of this. So they dig in to the same contemporary trends as any other city, like Richard Florida, then it's creative city, now it's smart city, then it's something else, then it's sustainable city. They dig into the same themes as all other cities do, but it always gets this extra The Hague touch. So 
if you're talking about sustainability in The Hague, it's not just sustainability, it's because if you really think that you will have to contribute to a better world that is more just and more peaceful, then climate change is not just a matter of technology, it's also a matter of doing that in a just and peaceful way, both in terms of who pays the bill for the local energy transition and in questioning of actually making sure that climate change is, is addressed. And a city can only do that much, of course, but The Hague can punch much, much more above its weight uh, than other cities because they are so focused. And then, of course, the beach was also mentioned, which they're very happy about. The local hoteliers had this thing that I said, well, it's nice that you have all these uh, international conferences and all these things coming into our city, um, but we also have a beach and we also have hotels and we also want Dutch families to come here, the beach resort, uh, and, and book some, some hotels. And we don't really see how being an international city of peace and justice is an interesting proposition for somebody to go on holidays for a week on our beach. So we want you to be a city on the beach as well. And then the creative people at City Hall, they say, can't we just be an international city of peace and justice at the beach? Um, but then quickly you start realizing that that might, might be unique in a national context, it isn't really that unique in, uh, uh, in, a, in an international context. So then it's about how do we actually connect these things? So the hoteliers, they launched a promotional campaign for a city trip for high streets, for the museum, for the beach and all these different things. And what the city does, well, did was they said, okay, okay, it's fine. We understand that you need to do all of these things, but we want to orchestrate it a little bit. So when you have these propositions, that is not about the International City of Peace and Justice, we still want there to be these hooks, that wants these things that pops up your memory. So for example, very simple, in, uh, in, in, in the video campaign, for example, uh, at Young Urban Professionals, where living at the beach is very important and interesting and so on, because it sets them apart from other Dutch cities, Make sure that you just see the Eiffel Tower of The Hague in the background. Make sure that he, his cycle route is a little bit less normal uh, so that he passes these hooks that amongst the right crowd is going to put in the same kind of association. Not even consciously, but just subconsciously proving again and again and again, remembering people at what they already know, strengthening and layering that association. And it goes further. Urban design. Architects are briefed by this. It's not a totalitarian regime, so they're not saying you should be on brand, otherwise you are not allowed to build. That doesn't work at all. It doesn't work at all. But it's interesting when you start briefing creative people and you say, well, this is our core narrative, this is our core values, this is what the Hague is for. A little bit broadly speaking, if the world would lose the Hague, this is what it would lose, because this is what we think we do, this is what we want to be, then suddenly creative people come up with creative things. This is a new uh, central station hall, uh, and it's one of the exits. Uh, basically, this was built because they needed a large bicycle installation on, underneath to put away a lot of the bicycles. It is still in the Netherlands. Um, and this is the exit that most people will take when they have to walk to the international quarter or to the government seats. So if you arrive by train in The Hague, this is the exit that you will take. There are other exits that will put you in other ways. And what happens is that you walk in, you have this thing beautifully curved. It could be everywhere, basically. And then there's this map of the world, and it has the text of the United Nations, I think it's the Unified Declaration of Human Rights, which could also be in York, by the way, anyway. Um, but the thing is, when that's in The Hague, it might be just a decoration of a world map. Most people is just going to pass it and they're going to think, well, you know, whatever, that's nice. But the people that know, or the people that stop and are being curious, they will not only see this, but it will also resonate with the things that they already know. And if you keep doing this again and again and again and again, you're basically building a very strong reputation. And the most important thing is that you will then need to do the actual promotion a lot less. So you will see less and less slogos for a better world. That's for internal purposes. This is what it's about. Um, International City of Peace and Justice is still being used as a tagline but it's not in all of these things that you've just seen. It's not in your face all the time. They're not telling you we are the International City of Peace and Justice. They're showing you again and again and again and again. And they're showing their own citizens this again and again and again. And trying, and this remains trying, trying to make people feel, not explain, but try to make people feel that if you live in The Hague, almost no matter what you're doing, you are contributing to a better world because The Hague has a mission of trying to do that. That sounds very, very broad speak, and it is. 
but it actually works when you start thinking about it that way. So that means that there are more and more people in The Hague becoming proud of the role The Hague actually plays on uh, the global scene. And that doesn't stop them from enjoying the beach. So actions speak louder than words. And the missing part here, basically, is York's core narrative. What is it that will unite all of these things? What is it that the world, or Yorkshire, well, that's obvious, or England, or the Leeds city region, is missing if York isn't there? What is it that actually unites York amongst something that resonates amongst its population? So that when you tell somebody about what York is about, not what it has, not all the assets and stuff, or the shares of the economy, or you know, the high quality of life, I believe the statistics, to a certain extent, but I want to feel that. I want to see that. If you are the number one high quality of life city, for example, where do I see that? And most importantly, where do I not see that? If that part is really important to you, make sure that the places where I don't see that is actually being fixed because you are not Paris. So if you don't deliver on the things that you're claiming to be for, we are going to hurt you in terms of how we work and how we think about you, especially if you start claiming stuff that you can't deliver upon. So this is basically what the project is about, not defining it from some people flown in or you know, drive, draw, uh, driven in or, or, or railing in from somewhere else telling you, this is what you're about, you know? this is what you've done. You, you gave us some money and we had a talk and we talked with a lot of people and then we came up with the big grand idea, the, the Steve Jobs moment, you know, this is it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to try to continuously ask the provocative questions, explain the simple basics, challenging people, stakeholders and citizens, to come up and try to define what this thing is about. We're not presenting that tonight. We only want to set a common ground about what this is about and what this is not about. And if you remember 7% of the things that we try to convey in this masterclass, then we have to be, didactically speaking, very, very happy. But it's not going to be the same 7%. So part of the responsibility when you're engaging in place branding is to make sure that you're all keeping each other on point and that you do not stop at a certain point by asking the obvious questions because you might be afraid of insulting somebody's intelligence because a lot of times we've gotten carried away and as professionals we're making these mistakes all the time we're walking into the same traps all the time so nobody's going to blame council members or members of the creative class or whatever for doing that as well we just need to keep each other sharp and this is basically what I've tried to convey to you today. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, there's a Q&A and there's a couple of people that are going to join me on stage and then you're free to just ask questions about what you just heard but also ask questions about York. All right. Thank you. <laughs> it's warm in that line. Yeah, I think uh, Neil is coming. Um, Jack, where is Jack? I have to ask that once. Yeah. Good. So. I have very, very strong headlights, so <laughs> I can't really see if anybody is raising a hand or something like that. Um, yeah, please just stand up and, uh, and ask your question. Andrew, will you try to manage it from up? Yeah, yeah. Yep, thank you. There we go. Um, thank you. That was uh, brilliant and insightful and fascinating. Um, and I'm a brand and a geographer person. <laughs> um, <laughs> a question I have is, can you, how are you going to help or enable us as a city to keep each other on point? It's a big mirror that we're holding up and to listen and to uh, absorb and to confront things that um, maybe we, we don't understand or we do or don't like or love mm -hmm. or whatever. Ha what's the advice about enabling us? Yeah. 
So what we don't want to do is, is leave with a nice document that says a couple of words and then say like, okay, so this is it, we've done our job, you're onto it. Um, this is also why we have this, for example, this masterclass. We want to leave you with an understanding of how this works in practice, what the consequences then are, um, and how it uh, sort of like isn't uh, a free lunch, right? So if we define, if we help you guys define what the core value is and what the core narrative is of the city, then we also need to show what possible outcomes of that might be, right? We cannot predict the future, but you would say, well, if this is one of your core narrative, that means this for, for example, York Central, right? That means this for this, that means this for that, uh, without, you know, disrupting all the current processes that are going, but possibly a little. Um, that, that's what we want. And then it's also something um, which currently is being uh, called train the trainer all the time. I mean, if, if you really need to, uh, if you want to, to establish this understanding in a city, you cannot just have people come in and, and, and tell you this once in a while. So you need to have people in the city themselves that are telling this to each other all the time. And ultimately, that's going to mean something about brand governance. Uh, to be clear, that's not really uh, the scope of this project yet, because that depends on where this ends, of course. But eventually, you'll have to think about setting up structures uh, and ways of working that really helps this. To give you an example, in The Hague, for example, I just showed uh, a lot of activities in The Hague. Uh, it's not a blueprint, but in The Hague, it's organized that there is actually a chief brand, city brand official who has to sign off on big projects and expenditure and give his recommendation just as much as the financial guy has. And outside of City Hall, uh, there is a, a kind of make a joke uh, construction, uh, the Hagen Partners, and they do a lot of the promotion and the marketing exercises, supply and demand influence, have a lot of stakeholders, a lot of private parties and stuff like that. And they're committed by contract to work as much as they can on brand. Um, so then you build it in, you, you get the professionals working in the discipline, not fighting some kind of totalitarian regime, but getting the tools to enable themselves uh, to, to enable each other, basically. Because there's a lot of people coming in, moving around, getting new jobs and stuff like that. So it really has to be a learning uh, organization. This is at least um, success criteria for the cities that get this right. Um, um, as the four of you and Sean here, um, some of you have definitely been parachuted in from elsewhere. So it'd be interesting to know when you've sat around tables and discussed York, um, what your three words were, what, what your initial perceptions were. Jack, you want to start? What were your initial three perceptions? Um, on the spot here. Um, Actually, uh, it's, I'm going to cover assets as it's easy to think about assets, you know, as, as Martin's just, just described, but for me it wasn't uh, the Minster. It was actually the Science, um, well, the Railway Museum, but I'm saying the Science Museum because it's obviously part of the Science Museum, museum group. Um, And actually, I think the first time I came to York, I didn't realise that it was part of the Science Museum group. But that got me think. That got I don't know. Did that did, that was surprising. So that element of of of, of surprise. Um, so Science Museum was one. So, um, train. What else? Um, it actually, I'm trying. I've, it reminds me a lot of a place that I grew up for a time in my life, a lot smaller, um, but also a cathedral, a cathedral town, um, Chichester. Um, and in a way, it got me linking York and Chichester and my own experiences there growing up, which were a beautiful place, visually, fairly affluent, but not perfect. But sometimes to a demographic, especially me at that time, dull on face value. And, but actually, when you got to, if you knew and when you got to know, the, interest is, the interesting stuff is there, it's just not always visible. 
and I found and I feel like York has that in in a way as well. So, for me personally, some of that interest, and I won't go into detail of what that is, is here, but it needs to be more visible in not just in in terms of values, but also in terms of presentation. I think so. That that's that's me. And I had it boxed in heritage in heritage city, small heritage city, heritage town, um, with a burgeoning cultural scene trying trying to get out. And I think that that was that was my preconceptions of what of what of what York is at the, at the beginning at the at the parachuted in mm -hmm. stage. How lovely! How lovely to be working in York. I think obviously mine was Jorvik. Um, I'm not better than the other Danes. Um, <laughs> what surprised me was that, um, and this is this going to probably either uh, pleasure you or annoy you, but actually I was surprised that it was smaller than Leeds. Um, because as I mentioned up there in the similarities with Utrecht, you know, former capital and you know, Northumbria and York, I mean, it's a city that I've definitely heard about a lot. Um, not that I haven't heard about Leeds, but that's more football and anyway, Rust Belt. Um, but it, that surprised me a lot. That was like, oh, oh, wait a minute. And of course it's logic. I mean, I'm an urban geographer, so I understand that the Industrial Revolution took off somewhere else after the railroads. Um, but, but that really surprised me. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, it also surprised me that it's closer to London than I thought. Um, but. Um, geographically, in, in my brain, I'm still grasping this thing about you know Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, coming down to Sheffield, going up to Nottingham, and then suddenly there's York in there. Um, it doesn't really fit, um, uh, which might be a good thing. Um, if you look at the Northern Powerhouse thing, which I've heard about, but because it's sort of like a professional um, habit, um, then that also does not seem to be geared towards dealing with the city that's actually not experienced the same kind of problems in all the other kinds of cities. And more and more, this idea which I started the masterclass with, that it's actually very, very similar to Utrecht, also in terms of internal power dynamics, uh, popped up in my brain. So I needed to get rid of it tonight, to not keep saying, oh, that's the same as in Utrecht, or oh, that's the same as in Utrecht. Um, and one of the chief challenges, I think, is that, um, you know, you can be an old city and have heritage and have walls and have a lot of things to prove uh, for it and a lot of things that are still very nice to see and needs protection. Uh, but one of the best ways of protecting something like that is to give it relevance today. Uh, and I haven't really seen a lot of that. Um, and that's something that worries me. Um, and that's, that's not only about the walls, but it's also something about some of the old brownfield developments in the inner city centre, uh, which seems to be... Um, developed in a way that is a lot of loss of opportunity, uh, not economically speaking, but culturally speaking, and in terms of livability of the city. Um, and, I, and I think some of these are, are challenges. Uh, also, obviously, walk the walls, and then you see a city that has turned its back towards the walls. And there are very few places where you actually have nice squares and stuff like that where you actually can experience this. And there are very few things that happens in or towards the walls, which might again be protection and stuff like that. Um, but but it's sort of like it, if you don't have the connection with those assets that people know you for, those hooks, with some of the new stuff that you want to show, then, then you're not helping my brain not stereotyping you back to, you know, city walls. Came all the way up. Uh, hi, Martin. Um, you... you in your diagram, you're emphasizing kind of choices, and you need to make choices. Um, and I'm just interested in maybe some of the some of the things that cities you've worked with or that you know about that, that they've had to put aside mm. to kind of challenge us and challenge the audience in terms of things that we may have to put aside to focus on where we want to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, it's, it's always a very difficult process, um, obviously. I mean, cities are cities because of diversity. Uh, so they are all you know, cities of science and culture, and they're all cities of this and cities of that, as they should be. Um, but we're not talking about 
not doing stuff. We're talking about highlighting stuff uh, and creating a narrative that adds meanings to these things. Um, so the easy answer to your question is that there's a lot of, th a lot of choices that um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't make those choices. I'm saying that while you're making those choices, you should deliberately and consciously think thoroughly about whether or not this actually also helps the image orchestration. So uh, on the place marketing side, which is not about tonight, there you have to really think about what kind of choices and stuff like that. On the place branding side, it's more on when we develop stuff that we have an idea about how this contributes uh, to York. Where the place branding stuff gets complicated with the place marketing stuff is when we say, this is the kind of city we want to be. Then there are companies, there are people um, that fits that profile better than others. And that's also a democratic problem because then we're talking about positive discrimination, we're talking about selectivity, and we're talking about all these different things. And I like to phrase it a little bit in the sense like, for whom and why are we going to run that extra mile? Is it just the money? Or is there a, val a value alignment in there somewhere? Uh, that, I think that, that's a very important question. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to paint some kind of danger on the wall, but I'm working with quite a number of cities that are suffering from over-tourism right now. Not because they haven't tried to deal with these things in the past, but because they've failed um, to, to tap into selectivity. Partly, they're not to blame because the airport is just, you know, developing, opening up, so, right, and British people are coming to Amsterdam, so, yeah. Uh, partly, uh, uh, the cities for this are not to blame, um, but if they've been catering to this as a business opportunity for a very long time, under the mum of saying, yeah, but it creates employment for the, the socially disenfranchised and so on, which a lot of times isn't true. Um, it's creating a lot of jobs for people that are not highly educated yet, all right? uh, not necessarily the people that are not highly educated. Um, but if we've been doing this for a very long time and we've been celebrating when uh, expats come in or when hotel change comes in because we measure our success as a city in, for example, you know, added value in, in the real estate of our land or an increased tax base or something like that, which, which is fine to, to take care of. But if we only measure our success and that kind of stuff, then we're only catering to those global markets and to those global prioritization, uh, prioritizations. And when those global markets hit us, um, not necessarily in crisis, but most as much in growth, then we will lose a little bit of our results as, as cities. And we sell that. And I think we should be a little bit more careful about that part of it. It's not even ideological. It's just, it's just from, from a place branding perspective, I think, well, if you don't want to be any place, then don't do the same thing as, as anywhere else. And what place do you think has got that best or done that best so far? This is the question I'm always asked, um, and I understand why. And I never answer it because... Um, I mean, as much as I think The Hague has done a lot of things very, very well, or cities like Oslo or Eindhoven, I'm not even mentioning, I'm trying not to mention cities that I've, only, that I've worked for only, um, but um, as much as I think some of these have been very, very successful, um, I'm always afraid that people then think, okay, so we need to do what they've been doing. Um, there is no blueprint for this, not in terms of organization, not in terms of what types of, of, of values you should, you should pick. Um, I like what cities have done for different reasons. I like The Hague because they have kept to their profile and they have translated that profile into something that matters to the everyday man. Um, I like that very much because it could easily have stayed an elitarian project. I like what Eindhoven has done as a post-industrial city. I like what Manchester have done much along the same things. But I also understand that The Hague had an opportunity that not every city had. I understand that cities like Eindhoven and Manchester had a challenge and a sense of urgency that not every city had. So I'm very careful of saying these are best practices. Um, and I'm even careful of saying these cities are best practices. I'd rather speak about leaders, thought leaders and stuff that are best practices because they have taken difficult decisions in moments where those decisions weren't fortunate for them. Um, and I think that's, that's the way to go. Um, it's easy to make a top 10 of but there are award shows for that, and I'm often in the jury, so that you can look those up. <laughs> um, thank you. It's quite clear York 
has a brand nationally, not internationally, but nationally as being its historic city centre. But we're a very small city that, luckily, for the city at the moment, punches above its weight in terms of history and place to live and that sort of thing. I'm working business, and we have a very bad reputation, I'm brutally frank, for attracting new industry, new office occupiers, whatever. And I understand your proposition of hook. You know, you throw your hook out and hopefully that fish bites, but you have to bait that hook very cleverly to get the right people in on, on it, the right fish on it. And it seems to me that York has a serious dichotomy here in that we have this city which has thrived to a great extent on tourism and its history and that doesn't necessarily sit very well with the image of trying to create an economically vibrant city in the sciences or the railway industry or whatever it happens to be not only is the city problematic in terms of physical space and and developed areas although york central may resolve that who knows it also has a problem with the workforce. So therefore, it seems to me this branding exercise may be an issue of trying to create an image like The Hague did. It was lucky after the Second World War, but it latched onto it and it grabbed it and it drove it forward. Paris has been driving it for years, this idea of romance and so on. Probably a lot by luck rather than good judgment because it was so pretty. But it, these are big, or certainly Paris and some of the other cities you mentioned are very large compared to York. Possibly we need to think about how to grasp a completely new image that no other city in the UK does that would be recognised internationally by grasping something which, say, the environment, green, whatever, something that's really in the marketplace at the moment, because this is about money at the end of the day. It's about making this city successful, both for its residents and the people who come here. It's about economic viability, I guess, or we wouldn't be doing it. And to do that, you need to attract new business. And that new business needs a new hook that no one else has grasped. But that is going to affect a hell of a lot of people in New York if you took a very strong decision to do something like, we go to the first green city in the country, we get rid of all our plastic, or whatever it happens to be. It's going to be a very difficult thing to do. And I wonder if you've got any views. Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, um I understand what you're meaning, but I have to be a little pedantic in, in terminology today. Um, so, uh, craft a new image, not going to happen. Um, changing an existing image, possibly. Challenging, problematic. The only way of really doing that is consistent, different behavioral choice as a city. Um, so, that, that's the first thing. On-brand behavior first, and then on-brand communication. Um, but knowing that the way our brains work, you, you've experienced it partly today. The way our brain works is that it's very difficult to change that. So you have to be very consistent uh, and very strong. And I don't believe that uh, hooking on to a theme uh, that is popular right now is going to help. Um, because if you are, for example, going for green capital of Europe or something like that, like Oslo is right now, um, and Ljubljana have been with a very large success and so on, um, but uh, if, if you were to do something like that, and I'm ignoring the political reality of today right now, right? Um, just out of example. Um, so if you were to go, to go for something like that and really claim sustainability as, as a theme, and you would be successful in that, you would be blown away uh, within five years by other cities because it's the same thing as with the creative city thing. It's the same thing as with smart city. Um, it's a trend, it's a hype, and it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It is, but if you are going to be sustainable, like The Hague is wanting to be a, a climate neutral city and all these different things, banning plastic from the festivals, but they have another reason for doing that. They, ha they have a different why behind it. And that's the thing that, that really resonates with people. So that's, that, that's one element of it. Um, I completely understand that there needs to be uh, a, a business-wise proposition to this. But then I say again, um, if we have resources that we want to invest and I'm saying if we have resources that we want to invest, we, not only city council or lead city region or whatever, but we as, as a community, and I count myself to that community just today. Um, but if we have that, uh, I want to spend that money as focused as possible. 
And then I'm faced with a choice. Um, if I want to have the interesting businesses of tomorrow that is going to create economic growth and employment and so on, I want to have the kind of companies um, that uh, needs the kind of people that York is creating. And if the kind of companies that are here needs different kinds of people than Yorks are creating, then we need talent attraction programs. But I'm not going to try to attract a lot of businesses that does not need the kind of people that York are creating, because then I'm keeping myself in a negative feedback loop where I have to invest more and more and more in getting different kind of people to come here, uh, because I attracted companies that need different kind of people than the kind of people that are here. You see the logic, right? So, of course, you can invest in education, that, that will prove out all these different things, but then again, then you're investing in the things that really matter. Uh, with that said, I think it's important to notice that the external focus skews things around a bit. Um, university towns, uh, I don't know if this is true in the statistics for, for York, but university towns are very, very good uh, in general, in creating new ideas and new businesses. And some university towns are very good and then exporting that talent immediately to somewhere else, where it then grows into fruition. So if you have to choose, um, should we try to keep 10 startups here, or should we try to attract 10 scale-ups? I would say, try to keep the 10 startups. Homegrown businesses are less capable of moving very quickly somewhere else unless they're forced to, because they're not given the right conditions to flourish. So investing in the business climate does not mean investing in trying to convince businesses elsewhere to relocate here. That's part of it, but it first and foremost means investing in the things that makes it possible for businesses that originate here, be they small, preferably, uh, to actually stay here and grow here. And in the long run, that's a more attractive proposition for a large, a large business who wants to come, to come here. That in yeah. itself will attract. Is an attraction. We've lost quite a lot of our own pair of businesses because we don't have the incentives, the property, yeah. the whatever, and they go elsewhere. Yeah. But then, even, even with that, I would still advocate for selectivity. Okay. Not just a startup, but which kinds? Um, One hand. Uh, thank you. I think it needs to work in the bar. I'll remember who's next. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, with respect to projects you've worked on in other cities, and I'm conscious of trying not to fall into one of your traps, um, once the, um, the place branding bit is completed or understood, um, what levels of support have been given then to the, the place marketing or, or the secondary communications, and how important is that? Yeah, that's of course quite important, um, yes. Um, basically, um, it depends a lot from place to place what's actually being put into place. Um, sometimes, the, what I would say, the image orchestration as a task, that means people that are trained in this, not uh, you know, advisors from somewhere else, but people in York that are trained for this, um, sometimes they work for the external agency, um, where their chief task is to help and assist other partners in the city to become more on brand. Sometimes, like in The Hague, they sit in City Hall, in, in city hall uh, and then it's a different power game. But the successful ingredients are there needs to be the understanding that a place brand strategy is not just a strategy. It actually requires a mandate and it requires resources. And the funny thing about place branding is that it doesn't really deliver tangible results because those results belong to the marketing world. Right, of supply and demand where they meet each other or real estate and all these things. That's where the real tangible, measurable statistic, statistical results are being created in jobs and stuff like that. Place branding doesn't actually come into a position where it can claim that we did this so that created that. It doesn't belong there. What it does need in terms of resources is not as much money as people. Yeah. And people cost money, I understand that, but that's the resources that they really need. And these people need tools that enables them to have an ongoing conversation with stakeholders and with citizens that is part explaining, partly sort of like sowing the seeds uh, of projects and initiatives. And then when some really, really big opportunities comes along, that could be a MEGA event or a MEGA redevelopment area like York Central, when there are new project teams being instilled to manage these things, at least one of them should be somebody that represents this. Um, because otherwise, those things are going to you know, walk down their own path and they're going to take over projects like this and organizations like that, uh, like this. 
because York Central must be a success. So everything else has to leave. Right? Or if you attract a mega event that year, everything has to work. So we put aside the marketing agency, we forget about our place branding strategy because we have to make that year a success. These things need to be countered before they grow into fruition. And that's not always possible. Um, but this is why you need to have uh, a governance structure uh, that is chiefly concerned about image orchestration. And I mean, in a sense, this is not that new. Um, cities back in the old days, uh, they were very much concerned about their reputation. A lot of times they waged wars and they had trade expeditions to increase their income so that they can spend that income on stuff that would increase the reputation of the city. Nowadays, for some reason, we've switched it around. We've said, no, 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 we need to work on our reputation, on our pride, right, as citizens, because that's going to deliver, you know, economic prosperity. What are we going to use the economic prosperity for again? You see? So we've switched it around, and I, I would like to bring them into balance and say, you know, working on the image orchestration, the reputation of your city, if places are brands, which I propose they are, and we choose to manage them as such, then that has value in itself. Because we think that there should be professional people that has the job, the responsibilities, <coughs> and the capabilities, and the mandate to watch out for the image of York as such, whether or not it has economic impact. This is a hard sell a lot of times, but... <laughs> There's a gentleman over here. Okay, thank you very much. I'll leave it. Yeah, it's close to football. Yeah, the, is it switched off? So the ladies are starting to play in yeah, 10 know, minutes? We know yeah. we're getting close to, uh, to, to kick off time. So. I guess England is going to meet the Netherlands in the. Not in the final, but in the game for the third place, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Going back to history just a little bit, could we not once more be known as the capital of the North? As a Game of Thrones um, fan, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't know. But I suppose it depends what you mean by the capital of, of the North in respect of definitely from a... Yeah. So, I mean, just listening to this evening's uh, dialogue and the fact that a place needs to live its brand, not just actually adopt a brand. I think, um, from my perspective, uh, I mean, I've been now in the city in this senior position within the, the local council for five years, and I think for me that, that while it comes through nearly every day from the people of York and certainly the elected members that represent York, is that York is an incredibly valued place by the, those citizens, you actually value its size. So there's been lots of discussion about this York being a small city. You value the size of the city. I see the local plan that's coming through. There's no proposals for York to become the big shed economies that sit alongside the M62, the Doncasters that are effectively looking to attract business for the sake of attracting business. So there is already a really strong brand here in York that actually it's a really valuable, great place to live and its size is part of that. I think the interesting challenge for me in respect to the city is how does it actually um, continue to outperform its size uh, on an ongoing basis and how it, incre it, it chooses to shine even brighter within the north of England on a successful basis for both for the people who live here but also those businesses that want to come here. And there was questions about uh, York being an attractive place for business and people and businesses leaving the city. I think personally uh, that my sense of pe the people from York is that actually the fact that we create fantastic startup businesses and they go on elsewhere in the north of England to be successful is a great credit to this city. We don't want to be another Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester scale of operation. So for me, if you were saying, can we become the capital of the north as in being the jewel of the north, absolutely, I think we can do that as a city. I often talk to my teams about the fact that the city feels like it's an out-of-focus lens. It's a diamond that could be polished a little bit more. 
and that's a, that's for me is what I hope to and aspire to get from this piece of work that we're doing is actually how do we add to the shine on what I think is already quite a strong brand take that the people of York and certainly the elected representatives of York have is that what you have is incredibly special. You don't want to spoil it by going too big from a tourism perspective, from a <coughs> just taking the next dollar that turns up in respect of a big business. But you actually do have a you have a, an aspiration to be better than you are now and the best you can possibly be as a city. And I think that that's for me is what I would like to see that we take from the, the from this piece of work going forward. Yep, I, I had a question, um, and that was to do the comments that you were making, Martin, all about development. I completely see a large part of what you were talking about in terms of managing the brand, though, um, was attempting to describe a solution for management, and I just wondered how literally we should take this, that often in York we praise, I think rightly, self-organising groups. It's when we see thousands of people coming together as an expression of common will that we get really turned on by it, we get really excited, we get really moved by that as a city, and yet your recommendation in terms of what we put in place is somebody who's more like a gatekeeper, like a, a permission giver, something which is in the old mould of the local authority, um, perhaps more than the new way that local authorities are thinking about, perhaps having to think about themselves, um, and especially in this country. So I wonder what advice you had in terms of getting that balance right, and if you like, organising, self-organising groups. Yeah. Oh, very good question, thank you for this. Um, also because it allows me to clear up a point that I probably didn't make as clear as should be. Um, when I talk about on-brand and off-brand and stuff like that, uh, places like doing the on-brand part, but they don't like to define what the off-brand part then is. Um, and sometimes it's just the opposite, or it's just if it's not. Um, this brand thing is not a binary. It's not either on-brand or off-brand. It's an ongoing scale. It can be more on-brand or less on-brand. It can be neutral, so it doesn't really do anything. Then it's also not harmful. And when it's about being a gatekeeper, I think the gatekeeping function, and I mentioned a couple of times, I don't want it to be totalitarian, right? Because a city is made by a lot of different people uh, and should be allowed to, to do whatever it likes, more or less. But if there are things that really goes against the value of York, then I want a gatekeeper function. And that gatekeeper function is not about forbidding, but it's about signaling that this is a potential image risk that can be an event, for example. Um, the Hague has the same thing. They also had events because politicians wanted those events, which was then polluting the environment and the beach and all these different things, but they just wanted to throw a party. You know? uh, and the gatekeeper function was they advised them, please do not do this because this will be the consequences. And they still did it because there were event organizers that wanted it and politicians that wanted to back that up. And then everything happened as predicted, and they got a lot of bad media representation. What did not happen was that the place brand strategy, all the people in charge, were blamed for this, because they had already advised not to do it. That's the kind of gatekeeping uh, I, I would prefer. The other part of the, of, of the thing is that um, it's not so much about um, forbidding or controlling or stopping things from happening. It's much more about enabling and empowering the things that are already happening to be part of a larger narrative. Uh, and in my experience, if you do that, there's, there doesn't even have to be a what's in it for me kind of uh, answer in terms of money or, or extra support if you're on brand or stuff like that. Sometimes that helps, but it shouldn't be necessary because the reward should be that your thing fits better in a larger, in a larger narrative. And self-organizing groups are paramount to successful place branding. Um, and in this self-organizing thing, um, it's, it's about basically facilitating that on a storytelling level. Um, and that's that you need to have the mandate to do that, you need to have the professional people to do that, but you also need to be to, uh, a, a, a healthy portion of humility because you're not telling them what to do, what you're trying to help and assist. Uh, and as I said, if something is on brand, um, then maximize exposure. 
if something is not on brand, we're not going to maximize exposure, but we're not going to forbid you to do whatever you like, because that's what a city is about, as long as you know you keep within the rules and regulations and, and, and stuff like that. And you all, everyone in this room and beyond has a role to play in this gatekeeping. Yeah. It's, about pe it's about people, not about a person. But a person can play a significant role. I think that's important. But it's about everybody. You know, you are all gatekeepers. And you will all be challenged to make conscious decisions about whatever sector you're, you're from about what it is yeah. you're doing and that and you know and that's what it's about it's people make places and, and, the, and the city council feels that participation of uh, citizens in terms of that gatekeeping on a daily basis so applications come in for large development or out of uh, out of scale development for the city we hear it loud and clear the gatekeepers of york don't want the place to become something that it that it isn't, you know, a, a place of scale, a place of size, a place of quality. Uh, so there are already thousands of gatekeepers out there. I think it's given a, a common narrative to what, why they all feel yeah. like that is a, a really yeah. important part of this work. So make, make sure it's not just intuitive. That's nice, but, but try to formalise that part uh, that you feel when, when somebody says, this is not York. It's like, okay, why not? Do you have to follow up on that? I think we have room for two more questions, and that's it. I'm interested in how you think, um, with developments like York Central and Castle Gateway, we don't how how you manage to um, not cut up the land and sell it for the highest value, which is obviously the worrying um, problem that we're all thinking about and trying mm. to discuss and stop happening, and how you um, facilitate a more sort of socially viable way of doing it um, while making the money that um, Homes England and National Rail have to make on it and how the City of York Council are going to do that because um, that's something that is obviously worrying. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, ideally, ideally, you would have your place narrative in place when such a development started in the planning phase. Uh, the earlier you start thinking about these issues, the more uh, influence you have. Um, but you do not have 100% influence on, on the things that's going on, no matter where you are in the process. And that's the first thing. There is a reality check here. Um, I know that sometimes because of land ownership issues or regulations or limited powers of the, you know, the powers of the government that be or whatever, uh, different from country to country and so on, um, that you cannot always force uh, the developments you want. But it helps a lot if you know what your city is about and what you would like it to be. In my experience, I, I'm married to a real estate developer that, that does stuff like that. So we have an interesting uh, uh, dinner table. Um, uh, but in my experience, the, the, the really professional real estate developers, they actually like it a lot when they come to a city or, or, a, or a, even a neighborhood that has a defined and distinct a story and profile because it actually add value to what they're going to do. Just a story. Um, what we would like ideally is that a development reflects the value of a city and depending on what that set of value is that can be very very much different. It might be in the public space only. Might be. It might be in the kind of residential units that's being built. Right? Who are they going to build for? Which, which target demographic for example? Is that a target demographic that the city as such needs? Or is it just you know, the big money that's going to increase the tax base and that's it? And then we need that tax base to reinvest in something else? Or is it actually people that, that resonate and that's going to participate and create some kind of community, for example? These things are limited in, in, in influence. But if you have a clear idea of where you want to steer these developments, you have a say. Um, and with regards to York Central, it's never too late. But of course, there are already big arrangements being made. There are already big lines being drawn and stuff like that. Uh, and sometimes it's also, if you can't change it in the behavior, you have to change it in the way in which you add meaning to it later. Um, I mean, all I would add to, to, to the York Central piece, and obviously reflecting that piece about living the brand and have been held to account, is actually have a look at the detail of the master plan uh, application that's been approved by the authority. If 
you were to look at a scale of development of the size of York Central in any, any other city, it wouldn't be limited to six storeys, it, it wouldn't be limited to having a variety of roof profiles in there, and it wouldn't have such an aspirational design guide. The reserve matters applications that come forward, so that's the next stage of planning for the individual buildings, I put the challenge out to everybody in the whole city to hold those developers to whom Network Rail and Homes England sell those plots to, to hold them to the values within the design guide and the aspirations are in that, that are in that design guide because they very much talk about the vernacular of materials in the city, the place and, and setting of those individual developments and it's really important that what we don't see as a city as we come into the private sector property developers get side of the, the next phase of York Central's development, that those developers don't push beyond the regulatory environment that members have already set the aspirations and effectively say, well, actually, yes, that your, your outline planning applications, or your outline planning approval is for six storeys, but we would like 20 storeys because we'll make more money out of it. We'd like it in glass and steel because that's cheaper to build, a cheaper envelope rather than the principal material of brick which is it within that design guide so all I would say in respect of York Central and those people in the audience are concerned about the quality of York Central you look at the design guide that's been approved use that design guide to hold those individual plot developers to task to the highest standards because there are aspirational elements of that design guide as well as clear clear hard lines if we can meet the aspirational elements of that design guide I think we'll end up with a really good quality of place. It won't reflect necessarily a suburban environment because it isn't a suburban environment. If you look at the city centre and the density of development in the historic city centre, York Central will replicate that. It will not try to replicate Bishop Thorpe or Acom. It's a it is a city centre piece that we're trying to develop there. Do you have do you have time for one final question? In thinking about um, the city centre, we all know the shops are declining and that may be a permanent change. So I think we need to rethink what we do with the city centre. And one idea I came up with, and this would be facilitated by the council, but to have activities run by local residents, and or you could have all sorts of activities, but the ones I know about. So you could have Tai Chi and St. Mary, um, the museum gardens, you could have local music groups playing, sort of informally. You could have, perhaps on a premises in Coney Street, um, activities for preschool and primary children. And I think that would be a great draw to people. Because if you have a young child in your family, you always have to find something for them to do when you go out. And I think this would also make local residents feel it's more their city, more involved, rather than it's been done to us, we're having entertainment provided, it's more their city and they're contributing. And I think it would also <coughs> improve the relationship between residents and the council. Uh, I would entirely agree with that premise the city centre needs to be for the people of York. If you look at historically what were cities for, particularly here in York, uh, it was a garrison city originally for the Romans. Uh, that, that was its purpose. We then sort of moved on to a place for market, markets for the whole of the Yorkshire region, people to come together for a social function of interacting and, and bartering and trading. We then move on to the sort of industrial Victorian period and we start to then move into people coming to a, a retail environment. That retail environment is moving away as we move on to a, an internet based uh, sort of sales and purchasing but we do have a very successful uh, SME small businesses and there's a really uh, thriving independent sector in York but the challenge that the city has is what is the social function of the city centre it's historically had those roles that I've suggested going forward what is the social function of a city centre and I think some of the ideas that you've put forward are absolutely in tune with that sense of a city centre is not going to be a place effectively to go and buy a washing machine or a new hi-fi or a television. That will be delivered to our doors in the future. So what is the purpose of a city centre? 
We're starting a consultation later on uh, this summer as a city council uh, called My City Centre. Members have allocated the, the money to that. Uh, the scope of it is yet to be determined. We're expecting a report to go to the council's executive, I believe, in August. And that will start to have that conversation with the city the whole city, its residents, but it's its businesses, but also its visitors, as to what is the social function of a city centre going forward. Banks are going to disappear off the high street, the major footfall, um, the major footplate retailers will disappear off the high street. I hope we can continue to hold on to and make sure we have a thriving independent sector, because that's a, a unique proposition both to tourists and to residents, but then the question is, is what do we do with the big spaces? Because we are going to create a big new space around uh, the Castle Gateway, so at the bottom of Clifford's Tower, all being well, that car park will move. There's a big space there, opportunity for social gatherings and etc. there. And then if you look at York Central, in front of the museum, the National Railway Museum, there's a large space there that's going to be created with great opportunities for both you know, for, for all sectors of society that we're trying to cater for. So big events that will be put on for entertainment, part of the city's offer to the world at large, but also they need to be events uh, that are relevant and important for local citizens. So I think if you look at the, um, the residence weekend in York, every facility across the city has huge queues around to utilise and make the best of what we have. The question is, is how do we expand that so that there are more uses like you describe in those big public spaces. But that's a conversation we want to have with you, with, or the members are wanting to take forward and have with you as citizens of York. All right. Will you close? close? We need to go watch some football. Okay. So, okay, um, I'd just like to thank everybody coming for this evening for the masterclass. Uh, there's a workshop tomorrow, is that right, Claire? Um, so there's a workshop tomorrow for, the, for those who are already uh, signed up for that. We're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow as we take this on to the next phase. And all being well, uh, by the autumn, we'll be starting to report back to City Council, but also to the citizens and groups like this, as to the, start, the emerging narrative that we're going to create for the city that we've started that journey on tonight. So thank you very much for coming and uh, wish you a safe journey home.